as you know, um, uh, Beckford uh, built Font Hill, and which is now lost, of course, and Beckford's Tower here in Bath, more from Amy later. And during his lifetime, he built up a wonderful collection of the best art that money could buy. And of course, this was dispersed um, at the beginning of the 19th century. But tonight, uh, Amy is going to describe for us some of his best of his collection. Okay. Uh, she is the senior curator at the Bath Preservation Trust. Holds, I'm not, she, she's told me not to say too much about her because she'll announce herself, but obviously she's extremely well qualified um, and as her, uh, has, is also, as, as well as uh, working at the uh, Breakfast, the, uh, the Trust rather, she's also a part time teaching fellow at Bath University and she's worked at the Trust for 17 years. So I want to give Amy a very warm welcome. 20 years. <laughs> Thank you, thank you all for coming um, tonight. Like Jane said, um, I'm the senior curator for Bath Preservation Trust, so I cover all four of the Trust's mm -hmm. museums, but Beckford Tower is the one that I have been at the longest um, and the one that uh, we are, I'm, I'm very pleased to say, has just been awarded uh, at just under £3.1 million from the Heritage um, Lottery Fund mm -hmm. in order to undertake quite a major project, which um, I might talk about a bit later, um, but core to that project is um, upgrading the museum, designing a museum so that in particular we can borrow. So at the moment we borrow from some private collections, um, but some of the objects and, and, and things that you're going to see this evening we, we can't borrow uh, because we don't have good enough environmental controls. So the project is going to give us uh, what we call a government indemnity standard um, museum so that we can in particular borrow from the VNA, the British Museum, the Bodleian Library. Yes, so um, the project will give us um, an upgraded museum. So, so hopefully some of the things you're going to see, uh, we might be able to borrow. So William Beckford was born in 1760. He's the only legitimate child of Alderman William Beckford, who you can see here in a painting by Joshua Reynolds. Um, and uh, our Beckford, as I tend to refer to him as, um, um, inherited from his father uh, uh, an immense fortune um, that he continued to develop and profit from. And that is a fortune uh, that came from the profits of the exploitation of enslaved people through the transatlantic slave trade. Um, and, and this fortune was obscene. Um, and uh, it meant that through that profits from, from transatlantic slavery, Beckford could acquire whatever he chose in terms of collecting. Um, and I think it's really important that we understand that while we can uh, talk about the importance of his collection and, and how every almost avenue of that collection, whether it was picture collecting, whether it was decorative art collecting or commissioning, um, has at some way been at the vanguard of change in British um, stylistic taste and, and development, I think it's very, very important that we remember what paid for it. Um, and, and that's certainly um, something that I've been doing a lot, quite a lot of work around um, in, in being able to actually trace specific objects or acquisitions through um, when a certain ship has come into Bristol. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an indivisible thing, and I just think that's, that's really important that we bear that in mind. Um, so Beckford's father dies around the time of this painting, so, so when, he's, um, uh, when Beckford himself is, is about nine and a half years old, and he effectively becomes the head of, of this family. Um, and to give you an idea of, of that wealth and where that wealth comes from, um, the first Beckford goes to Jamaica in 1661, and by 1710, he has somewhere between a million and a million and a half in the bank, and that's in 1710. So to give you, it's very hard to equate to the value of today's money, but add about six noughts to that and you'll get an idea of, of the kind of money we're talking about. Um, and in particular, the Beckford plantations were in the parish of Dorothy, the parish of Clarendon, um, the parish of um, St. Catharines. So all around this sort of central area of Jamaica, um, particularly starting from originally Port Royal um, and then later Kingston. 
Um, and when Bex's father dies, uh, he owns around 14 plantations um, and claims in ownership around 3,400 enslaved Africans. So it gives you an idea of, of the, the scale of, of the Beckford business. Um, Beckford inherits the family seat at Front Hill um, in Wiltshire um, and primarily the, the house that his father had built between 1755 and 1765. Font Hill House, which became sort of anecdotally known as Font Hill Splendens because of the splendid things it contained. So he inherits an art collection and he inherits an okay art collection. Um, it is not by any means the collection of a connoisseur, I would, I would probably say that. Um, and it has a lot of pictures in it um, that are not to Beckford's taste. Um, four examples of which are hung in the ceiling in the room next door. So um, the four Kazali paintings that, that are next door um, and, and Kazalis were all throughout this house. Um, uh, but the Alderman's collection also included things like Hogarth's Rake's Progress and the Harlot's Progress. So the reason that, that we no longer have the paintings of Hogarth's Harlot's Progress is because they were destroyed in the fire that, that is the precursor to this house. So when Fontenay Hill House burns down in 1755, that's when the, the, the Harlot's Progress is destroyed. So that's why we only know it from engravings. And then Beckford sells the Rake's Progress to John Soane, the architect, in 1801. So that's why they're at the um, Soane Museum. So this is a, a house that has no, no expense has been spared on it, but it is not necessarily the collection of um, a very uh, gifted collector. It's a collector who sort of knows what, what, he's, what he's buying and takes very good advice from, from other people, particularly agents. To give you a sense of scale of Font Hill House, this is the ground floor. Um, think Pry Park, but double the size. Um, this was a vast mansion um, with these two wings coming from it with a central uh, Egyptian hall, as Beckford's father called it, in, in the middle. Um, and this house is what Beckford inherits um, when he turns 21. And he does some alterations to it uh, and brings in some of his own collection. And what I should say is Beckford was collecting from about the age of 13. Um, and he's certainly collecting while he's on his grand tour. So 17, um, uh, 17 sort of uh, 78, 79. Um, and he is collecting pictures, works on paper, books, decorative art, furniture from a really young age. Um, that then uh, shifts or his kind of sort of continental collecting, his European collecting, um, takes on another aspect uh, once he is exiled from England. So in 1786, Beckford's relationship with William Courtney, the future Earl of Devon, is exposed to the public. Um, and Beckford goes with his wife into exile into Switzerland, to Lausanne in Switzerland where um, not long after, after the birth of their second daughter, Beckford's wife dies. Um, his children come back to Font Hill. They're brought up by his mother and a series of relatives. Um, and Beckford roams Europe for about 10 years. Um, and all that time, so he's in Paris when you can be a, a, a British person in Paris. Um, he particularly is in Spain and Portugal on and off for about four years. Um, and he also travels extensively to Italy. Um, and while he is in exile, he commissions uh, work to Font Hill House by the architect John Soane. And in particular, he commissions this, a top lit picture gallery. So this is a purpose built picture gallery. Um, and it is one of the first instances of John Soane using the pendentive dome. So this canopy dome that you can see, um, uh, you can see here. Um, which becomes, you know, one of the key kind of motifs of Soane's work. Um, and, and this purpose-built picture gallery is, is, is sort of a precursor to the purpose-built picture gallery that, that, that John Soane creates at Dulwich. So one of the first ever purpose-built picture galleries. Um, so Beckford is very aware of and obsessed with how art is displayed. 
um, but also how it is looked after. So he is very aware of the impact of natural light. He is very aware of what can affect particularly his works on paper and his books. So he's instructing ventilation, but no light. Um, and so he's, he's from the very beginning, it is not just about the objects he is collecting, it is also about how they are to be displayed. Um, that, that is very fundamental. So that picture gallery wasn't actually executed, um, but Beckford uh, spreads his collection throughout the entire house. Um, so he returns to England permanently from after exile in around 1796. And he starts commissioning and building a tower on the grounds of Font Hill. So this is the map of the center of the Font Hill estate. Um, that Palladian mansion, Font Hill House, is if you can, I'm hoping you can see the little red dot, um, it is around here by the lake. He originally starts building what his father had been building, which was a tower around here um, on the landscape. Um, and then he uh, changes his mind, decides to, to, to build it somewhere else, um, which is the big cross that you can see right in the middle there, uh, what he calls a little convent in the woods. And around the time of that little convent in the woods um, becoming, uh, in his mind, his future permanent residence um, is when this painting of Beckford is, is uh, commissioned from the artist John Hopner. Um, probably the probably the most sympathetic picture of Beckford, of all the portraits of Beckford. Um, but I think what's quite important, and knowing that Beckford very much controlled his image, um, is that he is seen on his lap with a book, but very specifically a book of prints. Um, and, and his print collection, his printed, particularly topographical collection, um, was extensive. Um, and this is painted in the hall of Font Hill house, so those big columns that you can see in the background. But of course, what he's building, that little convent in the woods, is this, <laughs> Font Hill Abbey. So it takes about 23 years to build, falls down certainly three times, possibly five times while it's being built. Um, every time set, it falls down, Beckford says, you know, build it again, build it higher. Um, and I always like to say you don't build a brand new house that looks like a cathedral and call it an, an abbey by mistake. You want people to think that your family is so ancient, Henry VIII gave them a dissolved monastery during the English Reformation. Everybody knows it was built last week. That doesn't matter. This is about the association of ideas. This is about building something that looks like a converted abbatial building to show the wealth, position and status of your family. Something that's even more important um, for the emerging merchant class, particularly those that are gaining their money through transatlantic slavery. Um, so this is very much about claiming a pace in, in British history. Uh, and it was effectively a gallery. So if you think back to that plan of that first gallery designed by John Soane, which was a single axis terminated with a statue at the end of it, in Soane's drawings, it's actually a statue of Apollo. Um, uh, it's exactly what Beckford does in one of his houses in Portugal, and it's what he does here. So a single gallery that goes from the St. Michael's Gallery here um, at the south through the central octagon of the 282 foot high tower into the King Edward's Gallery, through the vaulted corridor of the Lancaster Tower and into the oratory in which sat a statue by the sculptor Rossi of St. Anthony of Padua. And this uh, a single axis gallery is where he displays his collection. Um, and I'm going to try and sort of go through some sort of material by material, really, and, and, and aspects. And what I should say is that this is barely scratching the surface um, of, of Beckford's collection. Um, so what he's doing at Font Hill, when we think about decorative art in particular, um, uh, furniture, uh, ceramics, metalwork, um, he's also a big collector of stained glass and commissions painted in stained glass as well, but we don't have enough time to talk about that. Um, so what he's doing at Font Hill is he is collecting things expressly for these galleries um, or the collection that he's already put together. He is then working into these galleries and supplementing them with commissions just for these galleries. 
Um, and what that means is what you see is a mixture of particularly 16th century, 14th century, 16th century, 17th century when it comes to some furniture um, items that are uh, the sort of thing that Germanic princes were putting in their Kunstkammers, in their art collectors' cabinets. Um, but also he's buying Jacobean or Elizabethan furniture, or he's buying or commissioning furniture that looks Jacobean or Elizabethan. So he's, he's got original pieces and he's got historicized pieces in order for it to fit within this space. Um, but between that, he's also putting um, particularly a lot of his French influenced furniture and objects. So it's sort of mixed in, but it somehow fits. Now, what is a lecture all on its own is probably Beckford's greatest passion as a collector, and that is books. Um, uh, pictures came and went a lot. Decorative art sort of came and went, but not quite as much as pictures. Books he are hardly ever disposed of. He did sell them occasionally, um, but books were the one thing that, that he sort of dealt in a lot less. Um, and his book collection was extraordinary. Um, when he died here in Bath, there were over 10,000 volumes. It's a bit between the tower and his homes at Lansdowne Crescent. Um, and what you have to think is that these galleries that he's creating, every single space has books in them. Every room here in Bath had books in it. Um, but that's not just books, that's book bindings. So these bindings, and particularly what we call the Font Hill binding, um, which is the use of this, the Hamilton Sankfoil, which he can use through his mother, who was a member of the Hamilton family, um, and the Latimer, Sank, uh, the Latimer Cross, which he can also use through his mother, um, are, are real key ways of, of um, uh, proving back the provenance of books. Um, always in um, red, scarlet, crimson, brown bindings. Um, and so what you would get is this cumulative impact of all these books and all these bindings interspersed with a cabinet or a pedestal with a um, candlestick on it or um, a cabinet with vases on it. So, so they're all coming together um, within these galleries. Um, and in something like this, the view of the St. Michael's Gallery, you can really see what I mean about this sort of historicized furniture. Um, so a suite of chairs that it has been designed to look a bit like a Jacobean suite of chairs, one of which is actually Indian furniture or screens that have been reformed into a chair. Um, similarly with tables, or he might buy two chairs and then have two to match commissioned. Um, and he certainly does that with side tables. Um, so what you've got is all this sort of historicized furniture set within these spaces where you have, this is all new painted glass, but interspersed with then some older stained glass that, that he's commissioning. And on all these surfaces, key objects. So this amber casket that sits um, on the table in front of the window that looks south over the valley um, but in particular, this casket that you can see on the fireplace. So to give you an example um, of what Beckford is doing with all of his collection, actually, um, but with furniture and decorative art in particular, is he, he is buying an original historic piece and then he is having a stand or a setting made um, in order to then put it in a different location. So this is a piece in the Victorian Albert Museum known as the Holbein Cabinet. This original cabinet on the top um, from around 1560 uh, that Beckford acquires and then has this 1800 stand made for it, for it to sit in Font Hill. And what you'll notice um, is that this stand is classical. It has, you know, this is an ionic column effectively holding up, actually it's composite column, um, holding up the stand. Um, but the use of these sort of bosses is kind of hinting at the Gothic structural system. Um, so there's also something quite, um, you know, it's the sort of combination of things that stems from the Romanesque into Gothic. So, you know, he, he, he knows what he's doing when it comes to stylistic um, uh, changes and differences. So we're gonna have a look at some of his decorative art collection 
um, and where it sits or how it fits within the creation of what was very much the, the bigger artwork for Beckford, which was the galleries within which his, his art collection was displayed. Um, so this is the um, casket with the, of the crucifixion um, and Christ in majesty, um, French, uh, sort of um, like but not Limoges in, in terms of the uh, technique and the enameling technique um, from around 1180 um, in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, clearly quite a key picture, uh, uh, object for Beckford, um, or certainly a key object that later people comment on because it appears in various different illustrations. Um, but it's the, the casket that you can see sat on that fireplace in the St. Michael's gallery. Um, and you can also see it um, in the centre of John Britton's frontispiece for the book that he writes um, about Fonthill Abbey. Um, he actually writes it in 1822 um, and brings out another edition in 1823. So he, he writes it where Fonthill is still owned by Beckford and Beckford is putting it up for sale. Um, and it's uh, a new version is brought out the following year um, uh, to coincide with large auctions that are taking place. What was known as Fonthill Fever and I've just heard today, actually, so there's a very good little exhibition at Shaftesbury Museum. And if you've never been to Shaftesbury Museum, I highly recommend you go. It's a very good museum, all volunteer run. Um, but they've got a really nice exhibition um, marking the anniversary of the 1822 auction and sale at Fonthill Abbey um, with some of the kind of souvenirs that were created um, around it. So it's really worth going to see. And they've... Um, uh, they've got permission to extend it into next year so it was going to finish at the end of this month but it's now on um into next year but here you can see it britain britain um you know one of the great antiquarians in england is choosing this object as one of the best objects from beckford's collection and, and illustrating it um alongside an example of beckford's metalwork and a, an example of his east asian um collecting hard stones and ceramics um, so key elements of, of his collection. This is the King Edward's gallery, um, the decorative scheme of which was to show Beckford and his wife's descent from Edward III, um, completely kind of concocted some of it. Um, he, he employed a full-time herald, Sir Isaac Hurd, at the College of Arms to research his family's history. So the picture scheme in this space is all paintings of the Kings and Queens, House of Latimer, as is the, the painted glass and the stained glass. Um, here you've got a really good example of these historicized, pe historicized pieces of furniture. These are new pieces of furniture and you might just be able to see there's a Latimer cross carved into it there. There's a Latimer cross carved into it there. These side tables are all commissioned for this space. They're now at Chalcot Park in Warwickshire. Um, and then you've got center stage, this large uh, Pietra Jura tabletop on a newsstand um, displaying key objects from Beckford's decorative art collection. So that table, that probably one of the greatest pieces of Pietro Dura, certainly in England, um, is also now at, at Chalcot Park. It was purchased at the Font Hill sale in 1823 by the um, Lucy family. Um, this is the top a piece of Roman Pietro Dura. Um, uh, known as the Borghese table um, and, you know, Beckford says that it came from the Borghese Palace, and um, we sometimes don't quite trust things that Beckford says, but, um, but the fact that it was made in Rome and some of the provenance kind of suggests it could, it could be right. And what Beckford did is had this setting made for it, which if you can see has the Latimer cross carved into it. And these little bosses that hang down here in the corners are actually Hamilton sank foils around a sphere. So his heraldry is, is throughout this. Um, and, and this combination of these sort of sort of Italian classical pieces then with settings made for it to fit into a Gothic um, environment, but not quite being fully Gothic. And that's sort of Beckford all over, really. Um, but those pieces that sit on the top, a pair of ivory and silver gilt covered cups that are in the British Museum that you can see on the left. Um, and on the right, um, a, a cup and cover from around 1700 um, that then had later editions um, from uh, John Bridge from Rundle Bridge Rundle, the Royal Jewelers. Um, what I should say is this is a piece that sold in the, this cup and cover uh, on the uh, 
on your right, um, uh, is a piece that sold at the 1823 Font Hill sale and was bought by George IV. Um, and he didn't like the settings that Beckford had put on it. So he had new ones. Uh, he had them stripped off and these new ones put in in, in um, 1824. There was probably nothing wrong with the settings that Beckford put on it. But Beckford and George IV were rivals quite frequently in, in auctions. So he would have wanted his to, you know, I, I can do a bit better than Beckford. Um, so these are the sort of pieces. These, these, these are very Germanic kind of prints, uh, collector pieces in the decorative art. And you can see examples of that sort of thing in this group that's published um, by John Ratter in his book about Font Hill Abbey published um, after Beckford had sold the, the building in 1823. So there's our casket, that 1180 casket. Um, uh, and we've got examples of metalwork, groupings of Beckford books. What I should say is Beckford would never group objects like this. Um, you know, this is entirely fabricated by the person um, trying to kind of show the collection in these books. There is no way Beckford would display things like this. Um, but uh, it gives you a good sense of the, the, the kind of breadth. So ivory cups, covers, um, East Asian porcelain, metalwork, hard stones. I'm going to show you some of these. Uh, so this is the casket that you can see here in the back. Um, this is at Burley, um, and this is a good example of one of Beckford's many passions, um, which was for hard stones and semi-precious stones. Um, and he would buy them, and then he would have them put together into a piece, um, or he would buy a piece that had been made up of, of hard stones. Um, so this is a, a kind of really good example of that. Um, he's particularly collecting them in Naples and Florence and, and, and Rome. Probably one of the most sort of, uh, uh, I don't know, over the top Beckford objects um, is the Font Hill Ewer um, in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Um, this is a carved piece of hard stone, um, uh, believed to be from the Miseroni uh, workshop in Prague of around 1780 um, that had these mounts applied in France um, in, in about 17, uh, in about 1814, 1819, Beckford purchases it in, uh, uh, sorry, Beckford purchases it in around 1819. Um, and it is certainly one of the most elaborate uh, pieces in terms of this enamel and precious stone um, mount on it. Um, and, and is often illustrated in, in works around Font Hill. So as well as sort of uh, semi-precious stones, Beckford is also a leading collector um, of Japanese lacquer. Um, and in particular, he is, uh, or he bought the collection of the Duc de Bouillon in, in France, in Paris, um, who was a, a, a big collector um, of Japanese lacquer. And, Beckford isn't the first in England, but he's one of the first great collectors of lacquer. So this is the um, uh, Chiddingston casket. This is a smaller piece of lacquer. Um, uh, and this is probably the most significant or one of the most significant pieces of lacquer Beckford um, owned. So lacquer was being made, it's what we call export lacquer. So when the uh, Japanese, um, or when the Dutch were, were pushed out of Japan by the Japanese, I'm uh, sorry, not the Dutch, the Portuguese. So the Portuguese and the Dutch are trading with Japan, um, but the Portuguese are really bringing a lot more of the products, particularly export lacquer, um, into Europe. Um, when the Japanese uh, push the, the Portuguese out, um, the Dutch really take a hold of the market in trade. So all of this is through colonialism. <laughs> Um, I, I should say. Um, but the, the, the Dutch really take hold of the lacquer trade. Um, and the Japanese gave to the, the wives of the, um, uh, I think he was a, uh, I can't remember what his role was, um, but effectively something like two of the key representatives of the Dutch Navy, um, diplomatic essentially in Japan. Um, their wives were gifted two pieces of lacquer so um, the, the, the Van Diemen box um, in particular and the Boyce box, both of which Beckford owned. 
Um, and what's important about this is these are export lacquer, but these are made by the Japanese to give as gifts to Europeans. They are not made for the European market of sale. So that means this is a Japanese form. This is not an export lacquer trade form. Um, and that makes it very significant. Um, there are only eight complete surviving, very early important pieces of Japanese, Japanese lacquer um, that survive. Of those eight, at one point, Beckford owned five of them. Um, it, the, the Van Diemen box is, is complete. The Boyce box, he actually cut up for its panels and put the panels into a piece of furniture. Um, uh, but the biggest piece is probably the Mazaran chest. Um, which again is in the Victoria and Albert Museum. And this is another of those eight pieces. Um, and there's a partner piece to it that's in the Rijks Museum. Um, that if you go on their website, there's an amazing kind of, you can open the lid and go inside it. It's very exciting. Um, but um, I'm, I'm, I mean, this is recognized as one of the most significant pieces of Japanese lacquer in, in Europe. Um, but, you know, they are for an export market, but they're actually, um, certainly the Van Diemen box, they, the, the quality of them is what was being made for keeping in Japan rather than selling to the, the European collector. So I think that's quite important. Um, so this is the grand drawing room at Fontenhill Abbey. Um, the only thing Gothic about it is the fireplace. Um, and this gives you a really good sense of what's going on outside of those big Gothic galleries um, on the ground floor. Um, because this gives you a sense of particularly Beckford's picture hang um, and, and how he displays his fine art collection um, alongside um, furniture and decorative art and the centerpiece, um, a, a jade hookah pipe um, that, that some of you might remember. There was an exhibition at the Hoban Museum in the early thousands, which was treasures from West Country country houses. Um, and the hookah was, was displayed in that exhibition. Um, and not long after the exhibition finished, it was stolen from the house that it came from. Um, so it is lost. Um, we, don't, we don't know where it is. Um, uh, but what you can just see over here in, in particular is one of the most important pieces of Beckford furniture that he collected, um, which is the rise, sorry, I've left the E out of Henri, I've just noticed, um, but, uh, um, which is the, the, the Reisner desk um, that's now in the Wallace collection. Um, believed to have been owned by Marie Antoinette. Um, and, um, uh, and Beckford was a big collector of Reisner furniture. Um, so this is a, a, a secretaire. Um, there was also a commode that matched this that's also at the Metropolitan Museum. Um, and this is where you can see the idea of, you know, Japanese lacquer panels that were being purchased um, and were then being turned into very Europeanized pieces of, of, of furniture. The other furniture that he's a big collector of is bull furniture, so um, tortoise shell behind brass inlay, um, and it became a kind of movement of furniture, but Beckford actually owned original bull designed pieces. So a lot of this he's collecting while in exile um, in France. Beckford cleaned up off the back of the French Revolution, so um, the sale of aristocratic houses where a lot of art collections were getting sold. A lot of British collectors were sending um, their agents or using French agents in order to try and acquire some of those objects. Very little of it actually got back to England. Um, and you know, don't quote me on this. This is you know, anecdotal, but you know, it, um, it's something like you know, eight of Beckford's nine shipping crates got back from France while we were at war with France. So um, that's the power of money. Um, and that's the power of this obscene money um, that, that Beckford owns. So this is actually the sort of space that is more Beckford in a way, this combination of styles and combination of art. What's really difficult is that pictures move around all over the place at Font Hill. He's constantly moving pictures. Um, he's also selling pictures quite often, um, uh, but they are always moving around and it's quite difficult to place some of them in Font Hill. We have descriptions from visitors um, at Font Hill Abbey, but we, we don't necessarily have lots of inventories of Font Hill Abbey, so we don't really know where they all were. Um, but he does bring 
a lot of them to Bath, a lot of the best ones to Bath. So we have the Fonten Hill sale catalogues and there you can see the, the picture sales. Um, but in this period, probably the two most famous Beckford paintings um, were this pair, which are known as the Altari Claudes. Um, they are huge. Um, they are about the size of that projector screen, if not a bit bigger, actually. Um, and um, they were, they haven't been exhibited very often outside of Anglesey. They were at a Claude and Turner show um, that was at the National Gallery probably about six years ago, which means it was probably about 10 years ago. Um, and these Beckford spent a long time trying to buy um, and he exhibited them or he had them in his London house and people came to see them. And then they went to Font Hill. Um, and the reason I've kind of pulled these out of all the Font Hill pictures um, is because of the influence they had on Turner. Um, uh, Turner was working for Beckford. He was painting Font Hill. Um, and uh, you know, Beckford has this set of artists that are often visiting him, particularly Benjamin West. Um, and Turner goes and sees these pic pictures a couple of times um, and fills sketchbooks with them. Um, so this is one of the Turner studies of, of the, one of those paintings. Um, and he just fills page and page and page of, ske uh, of, of sketchbooks with those two pictures. So they're really, really influential um, as Claude was on, on Turner's work, but, but these two pictures um, in particular. Uh, Beckford has to sell them because he's running out of money. Um, he, he sells them uh, around, oh, again, don't quote me, uh, around, I think, 1806, 1807. Um, and uh, primarily because he needs the money to, to build more of Fonthill Abbey. He's running out of money uh, because the building of Fonthill is taking up every penny he has, as is his sort of obsession with collecting, at the same time that the transatlantic slave trade is abolished, so not slavery, that's 1833, um, but the transatlantic slave trade in 1807, and Beckford's income from Jamaica dries up for about a year and a half. Um, so he starts selling pictures, and the Claudes are two of the things that goes. So Beckford sells Font Hill in 1822, and in 1825 it falls down for the last time in a storm. Um, most of the contents had been sold. So Beckford in 1822 took his favourite bits um, and the rest went into an auction with Christie's. There was a public viewing, but in the end it was sold in a private sale to one person, John Farker, who then in 1823 had the auction with Phillips and Phillips actually um, supplemented the collection. They brought in other items to try and pass them off as Beckford items, um, um, which Beckford was very angry about. Um, and actually Beckford reacquired some of his own pieces. Um, but that's, where, that's why a lot of the collection, um, you will find pieces in country house collections around Britain, um, particularly Chalcot Park. They have a, a substantial Beckford collection uh, because at the Font Hill sale, things were being bought by collectors. And that's quite different to what then happens here in Bath um, when the Bath properties are sold. So in 1822, Beckford takes on number 20, Lansdowne Crescent, um, having lived on Great Pulteney Street for, for a little bit. Um, and then also buys number one, the West Wing, what's now Lansdowne Place West, um, and has a young architect, Henry Edmund Goodridge, in eight, around 1824, um, build the bridge that connects them together, which has bookcases along one side. Um, and key to understanding 20 Lansdowne Crescent, Beckford's home, um, is two key spaces, the dining room um, on the ground floor, and the dining room was where the very best of the picture collection was. Um, and then the five window gallery on the first floor. Um, and we know from accounts of people visiting, in particular, um, a, a German art historian that visits in the uh, early 1830s, um, the quality of the art that hung uh, in that house, um, and in particular, the dining room. So, um, uh, and Beckford's picture collecting is very interesting. Um, he is an absolute connoisseur. He has real passion for particular styles and particular artists. He is one of the earliest British collectors of early old Italian masters. Um, uh, but he also is a canny dealer. 
He will buy pictures that he knows are becoming fashionable or interested in, or his buying them will then make that genre or that painter fashionable. What I should say is one of the problems about picture collecting is that at this time, um, and particularly by using the sources that we have for provenance, so inventories and sale catalogues, is attributions to artists are changing every week. So he might think he's buying a Bellini, um, and then it later gets proven to be from the workshop of someone else, and now it hangs in a gallery under a completely different artist's name. So, um, but there are some that are, are very, um, we are very sure of. You know, so th those that are signatures and th those that are, are very clear. So in terms of um, his collecting, he's collecting a lot of um, Renaissance religious art. He particularly interested in the lives of the saints. So he owns a lot of pictures, particularly um, St. Anthony um, of Padua um, and also St. Jerome, which is something I've been doing some work on, you know, St. Jerome who um, uh, takes himself into a cell in the wilderness to escape and surround himself by study, which is basically what Beckford does by building Fonthill Abbey and, and building the tower here. Um, um, so the, the, they are Dutch, they are particularly Italian, um, uh, old, uh, early old masters. So, for example, um, you've got the, the, the Dividen um, on your left. Um, and here is a suite that is in the dining room um, when um, this German art historian whose name escapes me comes to visit. So, the, uh, and these are in the National Gallery. So the Filip uh, Filipino Lippi um, alongside two uh, Mazzolinos, um, uh, all in the same room, alongside the Garofalo and, and they very, very large um, um, uh, Tobias with the Archangel. This is a big picture. Um, and yet at other times, these pictures turn up in other rooms. So they're seen in other rooms by visitors or they're in other rooms in sale catalogues or in um, inventories. Um, and the other picture, so that's a, his sort of, um, you know, Renaissance picture collecting, just sort of starting to sneak into the um, uh, 17th century where he particularly starts collecting um, and buying some French pictures, uh, a lot of Claude, uh, Fragonard, um, you know, quite a, an interesting French collection. Um, uh, in that same room was this large sketch by Benjamin West um, of King Lear. So this was a painting made for the Shakespeare um, Society Club. Um, um, uh, but this is the sketch for it. Um, and Beckford uh, commissions a lot of work from West, primarily portraits, um, but a few um, really key um, uh, history pictures as well. So he, he has a, a very large painting of St. George and the Dragon that, that hung in Fonthill Abbey. Um, so it's, it's, it's an interesting hang, you know, we're not just filling a room with Dutch paintings, or we're not just filling a room with Italian early old masters. Um, he is, he, he, he wants the sort of dramatic effect of all these, of all these pictures um, put together, uh, but they also move. So this actually is then, um, in Lansdowne Crescent, uh, well, it's in the drawing room, uh, sorry, dining room of Lansdowne Crescent, and then it turns up in another inventory um, up at the town. Uh, so the key picture, so the other pictures that were in the, the dining room alongside those Mazzolinos and the Lippi and the, the um, um, Garofalo were probably Beckford's, one of Beckford's favourite paintings, the Raphael St. Catherine of Alexandria, um, which if you have never seen, and you're in London, it is worth going to the National Gallery just to see this picture. Um, the, the, the colours are extraordinary. Um, and the colours are very modern in their, in their kind of use. Um, very interestingly, when Bridget Riley was the um, artist in residence for the National Gallery, this was the picture she chose um, to, to work around. So this is a stunning picture. And, I'm a fan of some of the collection, but I'm not really into Renaissance pictures. So, but th this one I love. Um, and then probably the most famous painting that was in Beckford's collection. Um, the, the, uh, Beckford collected both Bellinis, um, but this was probably the, the, the key one. So, so the Raphael he sold to the National Gallery in um, 1838, uh, and the, the um, Bellini Doge Venice he sold in 1841. So this is the, also the thing, the minute the National Gallery opens, Beckford knows he can make some money. 
So he knows that his collection is good enough to be in that national collection. Um, um, so he is brokering deals or his agents are brokering deals um, for them. Um, so these were at one time both in the dining room at Lansdowne Crescent. They were also at one time both in the Crimson Drawing Room at Lansdowne Tower. So, so he is moving them around. Um, and we can see that through inventories. So this is the 1844 inventory, um, the year uh, Beckford dies, so made just after Beckford dies, um, which has in it where those pictures are going, whether they are going to London or whether they are going to Hamilton. So that is his daughter instructing whether she is going to keep them and take them to Hamilton Palace, whether they're going to London. So London could mean the Hamilton townhouse in London um, or it's for sale. Um, but actually quite a few of them don't have that um, annotation on them, which seems to suggest those are the ones that are going up for sale, which means they're staying, uh, some of them are staying in Bath and they're going up for auction in Bath. So uh, you can see Botticelli, Canaletto, Pollenberg, um, Tenier in particular, um, uh, more Pollenberg, uh, Thomas Barker's, he collected in Bath, he bought, he bought Barker's, Bruegel's, um, what else can we see on that list? More Bruegel's. Um, uh, and uh, th sorry, what I should say is that's the dining room at 20 Lansdowne Crescent. So that's the inventory for the dining room at 20 Lansdowne Crescent. Um, uh, so from 1825, he is planning tower at the top of Lansdowne Hill, which is being built uh, between 1826 and 1827. And the interiors are being fitted in 1828. Um, and the interiors at the tower uh, different, but exactly the same as Font Hill. So different in that completely different stylistic um, uh, uh, idea. Actually, much more at the vanguard of stylistic change than Font Hill was, mm -hmm. particularly the furniture. I mean, Beckford is cool. really setting the style for this sort of Greco Italianate furniture of this period. That's why the Bath furniture is sort of, in a way, more important stylistically um, than, than Font Hill. Um, but it, it, exactly the same thing, every piece of the collection, whether it's decorative art, whether it is um, sculpture, whether it is furniture, whether it's pictures, um, is all individually unique and valuable and probably the best example of artistry in that field or medium, because Beckford is a true connoisseur, he is not putting together a country house collection, he is, he is putting together a collection for the pleasure of owning the highest quality artistry that money can buy. Um, but when you put that one object inside the interior, it just becomes one part of a bigger creation, which is the interior. And then you put that interior inside the building and the building becomes the Kunstkammer, the building becomes the complete artwork. So what you can see are particularly cabinet pictures, these small scale pictures, a few large scale pictures, um, decorative art, sometimes undercover, large um, uh, East Asian porcelain vases, more of those sort of caskets of either hard stones or lacquer, lots of porcelain, um, and you can just see an original Giambologna rape of the Sabines um, on the fireplace. Um, that's sorry, that's the Crimson Drawing Room. This is the Scarlet Drawing Room. Uh, lots and lots more porcelain. Um, pieces of furniture being designed for the sole reason that they are to display objects from the collection. Um, and Beckford is continually writing it is about where a thing is placed. Um, that the placement of an object was absolutely vital. Um, and there's a letter earlier on where he's, he says, you know, uh, all, all we are doing is hanging and taking down pictures. So they're hanging them, changing, he's hanging them, changing his mind, and they're all coming down again. I mean, obviously he's not hanging them, but um, um, you know, they're coming down and someone else is doing. But in particular is this picture hanging above the fireplace, which is our own Dakota. Um, which is the first one listed in the dining parlour at the tower. So what that means is the scarlet drawing room at the tower. And you can see it at the top, poultry in a landscape by Hundakota. Um, down that list, you know, we've got, that's the other Bellini down at the bottom. I just I have a different Bellini. Um, but interestingly, what this inventory gives us is in the Belvedere, so he was hanging pictures in the Belvedere, at the, the room at the very top of the tower, that's the room for views. Um, and he's got a Jura up there. Um, he's got Steinwick interiors of cathedrals. 
Um, he has got all these different pictures, um, but the ones that we're interested in here is this pair of oval uh, uh, Pieta Neefs of an interior of a cathedral, which went to London, went to Hamilton House in London. And that's, this is the, um, uh, the Hunterkutter, um, which is now in Australia, the poultry yard. Um, and this is the Belvedere. Um, and these are the Neefs um, uh, that were in the Belvedere. Uh, Beckford's Dutch picture collection is quite interesting in that um, he has, you know, a variety of things, but he particularly collects um, these sort of interiors of cathedrals, these incredible perspective drawings that, that some of the Dutch painters um, were creating, um, not surprisingly because of his interest in architecture um, in particular. Um, so when Beckford died in 1844, um, his picture collection or what was kept um, at the tower, so what wasn't taken to Scotland or London by his daughter, um, was put up for sale in the 1845 sale of the contents of Lansdowne Crescent um, and Beckford's Tower. This is the tower sale catalogue, um, and uh, this is gives you gives you you know the, the remaining pictures, so the pictures that weren't taken um, uh, by the Duchess, so um, Canaletto, um, Domenicino. Um, there's about five five pages, um, and some of these um, sold, most of these sold, some of them didn't. But what you can see is the seller as the price that they sold for, um, annotated. Um, and, you know, £183 for a picture, that's a lot of money. Um, so he is, he is, you know, his collection um, was highly desirable. Um, and um, what's important um, is that the bath sale, what we get are dealers buying the collection, not collectors. And unless we have the archive of that dealer, it is very hard then to know or trace where these objects went. Um, unlike the Font Hill sale, where a lot of them went to collectors, so it's much easier to trace them. Um, um, but, but, you know, it, it, it's a lot harder um, with Bath. Um, but here is one that we do know where it went. So um, you can see it here in the catalogue, Benjamin West, um, a, a grand mass in the interior of St George's Chapel. What it is, is the installation of the Knights of the Garter. It's actually an oil sketch. Um, that is now in the Tate, um, which was sold for £113.08. Um, so, um, just a few, a few more slides. Um, uh, this is a letter from Beckford to his agent in Bath. And his agent in Bath was Edmund English, um, who was, and his family were a bit of everything, really, um, upholsterers, but upholsterers were, you know, they're not just upholstering furniture, um, upholsterers were who you brought in to fit out your house, um, or you hired furniture from them, or you commissioned furniture from them, as well as um, soft fur furnishings, um, and some even sometimes interior architecture. So Edmund English was Beckford's agent, um, and Beckford is writing continually um, to his various agents throughout his life about buying stuff. He is getting sale catalogues and he is writing three letters a day. I want this lot. I want that lot. Actually, I've decided I don't want that lot. I want this lot. Um, and this is a great letter in our collection um, written on the 7th of April, 1827. Um, so, so in Bath, during the period where he is, the tower is being put together. Talking about the collection extending to the tower. Um, um, and he's writing to English and he is saying, um, uh, uh, he's writing merely to observe uh, that you did uh, perfectly right in refusing that dirty, shilly-shally amateur's most ridiculously shabby offer. Um, and this is an offer for uh, pictures. So Beck, uh, he's offering them for sale to Beckford and, and Beckford doesn't agree with the price and neither did uh, English. The two pictures, though not um, in harmony with mine, so my collection, um, have that intrinsic merit and beauty, which will always command at least um, what their late fortunate proprietor has stipulated to pay for them. Um, and it goes on to say on the next page, um, Bath does not appear from late occurrences 
to be proportioned to uh, to be proportioned. This is Beckford's. Yeah, Beck, that's it. Great, thank you. Um, to the circulation of fine pictures, trash finds a ready market, um, and that is sort of Beckford's opinion of the art market in Bath in 1827. Trash finds a ready market. Um, and then interestingly, he refers to the Tenier and the Claude, so-called Claude, um, merited about twice as many shillings as you procured pounds. Um, so this afternoon, I went to see a community exhibition in the Guild Hall, um, put together by some community groups, Genesis Trust, um, uh, uh, community art projects that have been working with the record office. Um, and Holly, who is uh, one of the rare book, uh, the librarians for the local studies collection said, oh, I'm glad you're here, come downstairs into the storeroom. And I said, mm, okay. Um, and, and she said, we've found some Beckford letters. And I was like, oh, I'm pretty sure I know every Beckford letter that's in your collection. And they have a series of Beckford's books that he published in 1834 called Italy, the sketches of Spain and Portugal. Um, that I never looked at because we've got six sets of the first edition of Italy with sketches of Saint and Portugal, and they'd never been fully catalogued, which meant that no one had really looked in them and found that they have Beckford letters pasted into the back of them. And what they also have is a lock of Beckford's hair cut from his head on his deathbed, um, which is might not be exciting to you, but very exciting to me. Um, but one of those letters, and it's undated, um, but one of those letters um, uh, refers to uh, picture buying. Upon, re upon reflection, I see no necessity for purchasing the horse or the church, um, however cheap. Um, and Holly and, and Drew, the archivist who'd been trying to transcribe them for her, said, oh, it's about buying a horse. And I was like, no, it's about buying a picture. So that's a picture that has a horse in it um, or a picture of an interior of a church. Um, uh, and, and he you know, practically has no room for them. Um, uh, but he then refers to um, should the, and I'm still trying to work out because I'd like to say that's Bosch, but it's not. Um, um, and I think it's actually linked to the second word that, you know, uh, this bit here. Um, but should you buy the whatever for 300 or should the whatever uh, at 300 or the tenier at 720 um, go higher? Should they go higher than that? let them go. So those are the two pictures that he said he wants at that sale, but he will only go to 300 pounds for one and 720 for the other. So um, uh, actually that's probably 120, it could be seven, could be 100. So what I'm now trying to do is see if that tenier is also the one in that other letter. So this was two o'clock this afternoon, I found this. Um, um, and then link that to the ones we know he owned when he died and possibly that then is, this is the acquisition of that picture. And what's important about these pictures that are all being bought um, after 1833. So from 1833, 1834, he starts commissioning new pieces. And in 1835, he rents number 19 Lansdowne Crescent. Um, and at the beginning of 1836, he acquires it, he purchases it. And that is because by the middle of 1834, he knows he's got a lump sum of money coming. Um, and from November 1835, he knows that that's twelve and a half thousand pounds um, that is coming in from his compensation um, for the loss of his property um, through the abolition of slavery. So in 1833, Beckford owned four plantations um, and the value of the enslaved people on them um, was twelve and a half thousand pounds. And Beckford uses that money to buy new furniture and buy new pictures. Um, so I've actually been tracing this exact moment that that money comes in and what he is acquiring. Um, certainly furniture, lots of furniture being designed in about 1836. Um, and these are probably the last pictures that enter his collection. Um, and these are four lunettes, uh, oils on panel um, by Wills Maddox, an artist who was living in Bath at the time. Um, and who uh, had done some work for Beckford. Um, originally, he commissioned them from Francis Danby, and Danby produced sketches, but he didn't produce the pictures, and Beckford got fed up. And so he went to Maddox, and Maddox produced these. They were certainly in the tower in 1844, but we're not sure if Beckford ever actually saw them hung. 
Um, they might have been brought in after he died, um, mainly because in the catalogue and in the inventory, only three of them are listed. So the Annunciation, um, the Temptation in the Wilderness and the Agony in the Garden are listed. The Visitation is not. Um, and we found these um, in a parish church in Shropshire. Um, and then they were sold at auction and we managed to get them and restore them. So these are probably the last pictures that entered Beckford's picture collection. Um, we have three wonderful paintings in our collection, also by Wills Maddox. Um, this is one of them here uh, called The Objects of Virtue. Um, this is also not how Beckford uh, uh, displayed his collection. Um, and these were not commissioned by Beckford. They were, they were commissioned by his daughter um, as the collection was being distributed um, and broken up. Um, and what's important about these is because the objects that you can see on the left are some of the objects that we are hoping to borrow for the museum. Um, because you can see them in the pictures. So we want to be able we want to be able to hang these pictures with some of the objects that are in them, in front of them. Um, so what you can see is this ivory cup that is sitting on top of this other cup. Um, uh, you can see this beautiful sort of filigree casket, um, which is just here. Um, and then these are two absolutely export East Asian porcelain. Um, but what's interesting about these is Beckford had one of them mounted and he didn't mount the other one. So he's not interested in them as a pair. He just wants one of them. Um, so you see one of them in the picture. So Beckford is buying porcelain and then he's having silver gilt um, or gilt bronze mounts put on them. So th those, three those three objects are at Brodick Castle on the Isle of Arran. Um, after Beckford died, his daughter takes those objects that she wants up to Hamilton. Um, and uh, they end up then going to Brodick Castle, which is the honorary seat of the Marcus of Douglas, um, the heir to the Duke of Hamilton, so Beckford's grandson, um, and, and the most extensive collection of Beckford objects is at, is at Brodick Castle, um, where I was going to be next week, but um, train strikes are preventing me. Um, and then there is this, which you can just see in the corner here. Um, so this is a Nautilus shell on a Triton at Wadston Manor. It is one of the, the greatest objects. At, well, I mean, Wadston Manor is just full of great objects. But, um, and what's important about this is when uh, the previous project was done at Beckford Tower to stop it falling down, which some of you might remember, which started in 1996 and finished in 2000. And that was actually structural. That was to stop the building falling down. Um, these three paintings that we <coughs> own were sent to every National Trust house, every country house in like the Historic Houses Association to say, do you have any of these objects in your collection? Um, and the then curator at Wadston at the time recognized this, but not as a complete object because the shell was in one storeroom and the Triton was in another and they had no idea that they were supposed to be together. Um, so they were able to bring them together. Um, so, you know, hopefully maybe during the project we're about to do, we might have a, a similar um, uh, revelation. Um, uh, and, uh, but certainly, you know, what we now are aiming for and what the owners of these objects are very, very keen to happen is that for the first time we might actually be able to borrow them. We might actually be able to, to, to bring the one thing that we don't have a lot of, which is the actual decorative art collection. Um, into the museum. We will probably only borrow about four or five pieces because if we borrow more than that, I will never sleep at night because they are so valuable. <laughs> um, but it will really give a sense of, I think that might be my last slide. Um, it will really give a sense of um, just how good uh, Beckford's collection was really. So thank you. <laughs> Ran a bit, and I promised I wouldn't. But um, anyway, thank you so much, Amy. Um, eye-watering amounts. What would three hundred pounds equate to today? Do you think you mentioned a painting for three hundred pounds? Um, probably about two million. Oh, a million. Me. Yeah. Gosh, yeah. yeah. Eye-watering. It's an obscene. Yes. Uh, well, I, I really don't know. Um, 
what to say. There's so much there. And um, do you think you'll ever end, finish finding things, finish no. your task? Come to the end <laughs> no, of your probably task. Not. Uh, finding probably not. Um, and, and actually, Beckford, uh, I think the minute Beckford would have felt that his collection was complete or that his building was finished, he would give up. Um, he's, it's why he's constantly changing things and he's constantly moving things around. Um, it, it was never finished. It was never complete. Um, that's probably, it's probably my job, really. Yeah, it's never going to be finished. Yeah. Mike's job. Yeah. Um, well, do we have a couple of questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, right, okay. Uh, now there's a special implement. I shall bring this round. Mm -hmm. May I ask, was Beckford, when he was doing the various rooms, were the carpet designs related to the themes in the room? Um, a bit, but not really. I mean, he's, he, he is collecting, he is acquiring textile. So there's, but well, he inherits textile from his father. So there's tapestries that we know were at Font Hill House. Um, uh, but he's not a textile collector. So he, he has some carpets that are, you know, good carpets from good um, makers. Um, but then he's not really on the whole commissioning. It's not like Robert Adam, you know, it's not, the car, it's not mirroring the design. The, the one really interesting exception um, is in the full length deathbed portrait. So we've just acquired the, the deathbed portrait of Beckford, which is the sort of head study. The full length version, which is at Broadwick Castle, which they are also going to lend us. Um, it, it's very clearly curated by Beckford, um, his deathbed scene. Um, and you see key pieces of furniture and uh, books on the chair and picture on the wall and the carpet is his coat of arms um so was obviously woven um for him um but he's not really he's less sort of interested in that i think mm -hmm. really um and you know it, it serves a function it, it's sort of a bit like draperies and you know he well he would have been very exacting if he didn't like the design that you presented to him um but they were sort of part of the whole they're the kind of um enhancements for what's really important which is the objects yeah. um, amy when he was in france during the french revolution mm -hmm. um, how personally dangerous was it his collection stuff and how good a haul did he get from it's quite interesting, Beckford's um, kind of time in France. He spends quite a lot of time in France uh, when it's safe to do so, when he's young, when he's on a grand tour, and he spends a lot of money and he has a lot of money. So, um, and speaks fluent, fluent French and, and actually there's quite a lot of his personality that's much more continental European um, in, in his kind of behavior and, and so he, he enjoyed France and the, and the Parisians liked him. So I, I don't, I, I've, well, I don't read French. So the letters, Beckford's letters that really cover a lot of this, I've yet to be able to read, uh, but I'm working on that. Um, but um, I don't think he was fearful for his safety. Um, he's sort of in and out a bit as well. Um, and he's sending agents. I mean, when it's very, very sort of dangerous, he's not going, it's, it's his agents that are going. Um, but the agent is probably saying it's for Monsieur Beckford and that will open doors and that will get things through. So um, he, he gets a lot back when really not a lot of collectors are. You know, some of that furniture and some of that lacquer, you know, the, the Duke de Bouillon, I mean, he's, he's able to buy that collection because it's, it's, it's put up for sale because of the, the revolution. So, um, you know, he's, he's, yeah, he's, he's getting quite a lot, um, but it's money. He, he has so much money. Um, <laughs> I think he's got a question, yeah. Yeah. Our last question. Yeah. Thank you. I think you gave some very different 
Portugal and mm. um, why you picked his interest in Portugal and why you picked the place he did. And also, did he entertain? Did he, who did he mix with? Yes, yeah, so Portugal was, he was supposed to be going to Jamaica um, and he was on the, his father's yacht, the Julius Caesar, which tells you a lot about his father. Um, and he lands in Lisbon um, as a stop and then doesn't leave. Um, and, and his letters, particularly his letters from his agent, um, his business agent, his Jamaican business agent in London, um, that the letter book is sort of, um, I understand you will be leaving next week. And then he writes another letter to his brother who's in Jamaica and says, you know, Mr. Beckford will be, you know, with you within two months and then two months and he's still not left and he's still not left. And, and, and in the end, it, it's apparent he is not going to go. He is going to stay in Portugal. Um, and um, he was he was really well accepted in Portugal. The only place he wasn't accepted was in the Portuguese court. Um, and that was probably because they didn't want to upset the English court because Beckford is a social outcast. Um, but uh, people would visit him. He was invited to all the kind of principal aristocratic houses. Um, he, he was really part of Portuguese society um, and loved it there. He, he, he loved it there, um, particularly the music. Um, so it, it suited him. Um, he could be a bit of a big fish in a small pond in Portugal. He travels into Spain quite a bit. Um, and then he's also, you know, he's also uh, in Italy, particularly staying with his second cousin, Sir William Hamilton in Naples. Um, um, and, and so the first lady Hamilton, Catherine Hamilton Beckford just adored, absolutely adored her. Um, so, and I guess that's the other thing, Beckford is also acquainted with, related to, or friends with other collectors. So William Hamilton in particular, um, and then um, his son-in-law, Alexander Hamilton, 10th Duke of Hamilton, had a phenomenal collection. So, um, you know, they have, they have common interests. Um, but yeah, he really, you know, he really liked Portugal. Um, well, thank you very much, Amy. Oh, you're welcome. It's a pleasure.